Hi, everyone. I'm Zach Ali. I'm co-founder of Rant Media, and today I am joined by Pennsylvania State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta. Malcolm was elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 2018 to serve the 181st District. Malcolm, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, so the 181st District, that is Northern Philly, right? The Temple That's area. North Philly, right in the heart of the city. That's right. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I have a friend, I have a few friends that have gone to Temple. Always great things to say. Apparently it's a really fun school to attend. Great community. Um, are you from Northern Philly, born and raised? Yep, so I'm right from North Philly. Temple is like right in the heart of my district, in the heart of the city, the best part of the city, hands down. Um, and so, you know, Temple has produced a, a bunch of incredible folks who've gone on to media and, scholarship and academia you know you just you just go down the list um so it's a it's a great community and it's where i'm from i also went to temple grandma went to temple parents met on campus so yeah got a legacy there that's right <laughs> that is really cool all right well i guess we'll just jump right into it so since you've been elected you've clearly made quite a name for yourself um from the viral moment where you were defending service workers which is how i came to find you um, to getting to speak at the DNC, you are propelling yourself very rapidly to national recognition. So I'd like to ask where it all began. Um, what made you choose to decide uh, to go into a career in public service? So also right here in, in North Philly. <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, third generation to this, to this district, which I now serve in this capacity. And my grandfather actually was a civil rights activist as well, Muhammad Kenyatta. I would encourage people to go Google him. Um, and, you know, so I really get it honest. My, my dad did not sort of follow that exact path, but he became a social worker. And my mom was a CNA and then was a home health care aide and raised me with my three wonderful siblings who they all adopted. And so it was this really, you know, wonderful sort of, you know, mixed, mixed family. But the thing that was really, you know, without question in my house, like particularly with my mom after my parents got divorced or we rather young, it was like, you were going to do something, right? You were going to get engaged somehow. And so I'll never forget, I came home, I was 11 or 12. And, you know, I came home to Woodstock Street, it's this beautiful street in my, in my now district. And, you know, I was just talking to my mom about like all these different issues as I saw them, right? And my mom, without skipping a beat, you know, she's a tough black lady. We lost her three years ago now. Um, but oh, she was an incredible... Idea. Yeah, thank you. She was an incredible woman. And so without skipping a beat, she was like, you know, well, boy, if you care so much, go do something about it. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I ran for junior block captain. And it was the first thing I ever did in terms of civic engagement. And it really sparked this belief in myself at a young age that you really could have opinions and a vision about things that you wanted to see happen in the community. And you could just go out there and make it happen. And I think, you know, I hear her voice in my head all the time. Um, and particularly, you know, that piece of, of what she said, there are a variety of different things that, you know, we all know are wrong in our communities, know are wrong in our country. And ultimately, like nobody's coming to like freaking save us. We have to just step up and do it. 100%. Um, and uh, again, sorry to hear that. I also lost my mother when I was young um, to yeah. um, early onset Alzheimer's. And I know you talk a lot about um, the need for care um, and making it more accessible. Yeah. You're and part helping. of a club none of us want to be a part of. Yeah. Yes. And you, like you said, you hear that voice. They're with you always and mm -hmm. telling you to do the right thing. Um, <laughs> so, and, and that just it makes it even more relatable. So, which makes your voice even more needed in government. Um, but not only because you you speak very forcefully for your constituents that you represent, um, but also because of your identity um, as a black gay male, probably the first, I I'm assuming the first to ever be elected to the Pennsylvania yes. House of Representatives. <laughs> to state government, to state government <laughs> right. in general, yeah. yeah. And to speak uh, at the DNC, so, you know, as a keynote, so it was really cool. So you've already broken new ground uh, in ways you're trailblazing. Um, so, which is, which is leads me to ask, um, do you feel like your office carries an added level of responsibility knowing that 
you do belong and represent two marginalized groups? So, so this is always my hope, right? Um, you know, and like, you know, being completely candid, right? You know, so cool, like to speak of the DNC, right? Oh my God, a cool opportunity. But the reality is, I've had a lot of people ask me about this, is I will be really excited when the barriers that we're breaking, it's no longer this exciting thing, right? Like that will be exciting. Right. When it's so normal, when there are so many of us at all levels of government that it stops being this conversation, frankly, <laughs> like in some right. ways. And so my hope is that there are, you know, queer kids, young black kids who aren't looking and saying like, oh my God, look how cool Malcolm is, look at what he did. But more are saying, look what I can do, right? Because I do think there's this responsibility. I grew up and, you know, I'm trying to think other than like Harvey Milk, I didn't recognize until I got older that like Bayard Rustin was, you know, was, was queer, you know? So like, I, there were very few people who even from historical perspective that I could look at and say, oh my God, I want to be that. And I think right. it's so difficult for young people to be something they don't see. And, you know, my hope is that, you know, me and so many of the other, you know, young queer people who are stepping up and running for office, um, that it really opens the, 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 the floodgates and that people, um, particularly young people, that they can see themselves. I mean, we know that when we look at the rates around suicide or around um, homelessness, young people are kicked out of their home. Those rates are always astronomically higher for young queer kids. And it's because when you turn on the TV screen, there are very few images of people that look like you and you know with all due respect to like my great you know white cis friends in many cases like they look like them and so it's still not my experience <laughs> being showcased and so right I, I i i feel not necessarily you know pressure um i feel hopeful that there are people who are watching and that they are seeing themselves. And I think that that's right. going to be, you know, in incredible. Yeah. A hundred and agreed. There's someone who saw you on the DNC or in that viral now this video that are saying, I can be that now I can, you know, you don't have to marginalize yourself into being, uh, you know, I remember on the playground, right? Like uh, I'm Arab American. So I, I could never be the main character when we played superheroes, right? I had to be the one that kind of looked like, you know. Some, you know, like some side. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. You, you get it. And, I, you know, and you may never, and I may never even meet some of those young people, but they're out there and they're, and they're watching and they're soaking this all in. And it, it, just, it just is an incredibly emotional thing, thinking about them sitting in front of that screen, you know, TV or probably their phone more likely, right? Because of right. our world now. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to what they're gonna do. And so, you know, like 10 years from now, somebody will stop me and say like, I saw your speech and inspired me to run for office. And then I'll like just break down crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, in order for it to just be commonplace, it has to, uh, it has to start somewhere. <laughs> I think I might, the connection's a little bad. Can you still hear me? I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I lost you for a little bit there. Um, so my next question is, I really wanted to ask about, um, obviously, the, that, the elephant in the room is the pandemic, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's taken the world, this country, by storm. Uh, we're doing worse than every other country. So I'd say specifically it's taken this country by storm. Um, and the effects have been devastating. And more so for people of color, um, which I'd like to ask, why is that happening? Why is it that people of color are so disproportionately affected? And, um, and also, do you, you know, this is kind of m maybe out of pocket a little bit, but do you feel like that fact that people of color are being affected um, disproportionately is playing into why conservatives have been so lackluster in their response? You know what, um, you know, and I'll start with the end of your question first. I, I did personally feel a shift, right? You know, there were, you know, a lot of messaging in the beginning of this from everybody, you know, that we're all in this together. And for yeah. a month or two, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, maybe even with this ridiculous, you know, buffoon 
in the White House. Like maybe we all are in this together. You know, he was on an island for a little bit saying this, you know, wasn't serious or don't worry about it or let's right. just focus on the stock market. Um, and at, you know, all levels, there was this sense that, okay, you know, just like when we're at war or when there's, you know, incredible tragedy, people tend to come together. There's this sort of rally effect. And, you know, once the, the data around this became more apparent, I do feel like there was the sense of like, you know, well, well who cares now, right? Um, you know, black and brown folks have been impacted overwhelmingly. Uh, yeah. You know, some of the statistics around you know, around Black businesses. I mean, some studies are saying 41% or more of all Black-owned businesses may never reopen. I mean, that is staggering. I mean, four in 10 Black-owned businesses may never reopen. I mean, this is shocking. And we learned today that instead of targeting PPP and other programs that were supposed to be safety nets for these businesses, the president and his administration gave these loans out and these forgivable these forgivable loans and the grants and any money they had gave them out to his friends and buddies and i just saw one article that one of the companies that got it used the money used our taxpayer money to then go and buy billboards to support the president i mean yep. it is absurd and i'm at a point where every day i'm pinching myself and say like you cannot become numb to this, you know, you have to every single moment be outraged. We really do have to continue to be outraged and not outraged just for outrage sake, but to remind ourselves that like, this is not normal and right. that we should expect more from our government. And when you think of, you know, why, um, it's the question we're asking all the time. Why do we live in a country right now where universal health care is not available, where, you know, every person, you know, does not cover it in some way. I mean, that is still a, a fight that we're having. We still have a major political party in court fighting to take away health care during a pandemic. Like, it boggles the mind. Like, yeah. it boggles <laughs> the mind. Right. That this is, that these are conversations we have to have, and it's on a variety of different issues, like not just this pandemic, but when you look at like issues with the environment, the reality is the impacts of climate change are not felt equally. There is an incredible study done by Rice University and University of Pittsburgh that looked at superstorms and how folks recover um, after these natural disasters. And as you might imagine, white Americans not only on average recover, but they end up in many cases, a little bit better off than they right. were after um, a tragedy like that. Obviously not, not everybody, but in many cases, they get FEMA, they get the loans, they get everything they need. Black families on average never, never rebuild. I mean, and these, you know, it's just over and over and over again. And so there comes this time where, you know, and I say this, we can't have race neutral policies. Like, because the right. impact of policy is not race neutral. And so yeah. this idea that we're just going to craft things that, you know, sort of codedly talk about race or kind of talk about race. I mean, we have to talk about that. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I totally agree that we can't normalize. None of this is normal. We can't pretend that a thousand deaths a day is acceptable or just a number on the screen. Um, uh, and you're right. It's a systemic issue. It's not something you can blanketly pass policy and say, okay, everyone's going to be okay because you know who the chances are one, the per people writing those policies look like the people who are going to benefit most from them. And two, um, there's just differences that we have to acknowledge um, in education, in level of income, in access to tools and help and resources that one side has so much more access to than the other. And until we but, but start, also, you know, yeah. but also like we just, it's just like racism, right? Like, right. you know, yeah, one of the examples up. is like, like home, home ownership, right? <laughs> Black and yeah. brown folks, even if they have, if they attain a college education, right. still percentage wise have less access to owning a home than, you know, white Americans who've only finished high school, right? So, right. you know, so I, I, I'm just at this place where like, 
we need to, and I know it makes so many people like, oh my God, I'm uncomfortable. But like, we need to have this conversation because yeah. it infects every single part of our society, even when we're not consciously thinking about it. And that's what's so insidious about it. You don't even have to yeah. think about it. Right. And you're right. No more dancing around the issue. Let's call it what it is. It is racism. That is what's happening. Um, and so I guess that's a great, great segue into my next question, which is um, George Floyd's horrific death um, in Minneapolis. It was a video that shook the world awake um, to the injustices that are constantly being carried out against Black Americans by law enforcement, police brutality. Um, and even just recently, uh, the police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, shot an unarmed Black man seven times in the back as he was walking to his car while his children were in the car. What work still remains to be done to fix this very clear problem in our policing? Um, where do we start? I mean, I think we start with like having a fucking heart. Like, right. you know, I, I can't even imagine, you know, I only have guy kids. Yeah. But I can't imagine, you know, for those kids to watch your dad be shot like that, shot down like a dog in the street. I mean, we wouldn't even shoot a dog in the street. I mean, I think people would be up in arms about that. Right. I mean, there is no parallel of anything that we treat like that in our society other than black and brown bodies. I mean, it is, you know, that after, after watching uh, the video of George Floyd's death, you know, I made a very conscious choice of like, I cannot, I, I can't see these videos, you know, like I've seen enough of them. I know what it is. I know what it means personally to be stopped and frisked and thrown to the ground for no reason. Wow. Other than the color of my skin. Um, wow. You know, I know what that feels like personally. I know so many people who know what that is. And every time you see these videos, there's this cruel reminder for you know, particularly black, but also brown Americans, that not only could that be you, but statistically it might very well be you next. Very well be you next. I mean, most people had never heard of Kenosha, right? Like, right. and now here we are with yet another tragic shooting of an un unarmed, you know, black man. I mean, he stopped to break up a fight. Right. Uh, and, 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 and here he is now, at the very least, paralyzed, paralyzed. And they're still handcuffing him in the hospital as he's laying in the hospital bed paralyzed, which is just insult to injury. And so from my perspective, we have a system that is deeply, deeply broken that we need to fundamentally reimagine. If you talk to law enforcement, there are so many issues um, that they themselves say, like, we should not be the first line of, you know, response to that. Um, and I think that that is absolutely fundamentally true, and we need to do that. We also need to deal with some of the issues around arbitration, which allows so many of these bad officers to remain on the force, even when there are higher ups within the police departments that want to remove some of the officers, they'll, you know, be put on suspension and then they'll come back. And in all cases, it's not the chief saying like, you know, welcome back. In some cases, the arbitration process says you have to take them back. And so we need to deal with arbitration. We need to deal with qualified immunity. We need to deal not only with training, but with retention and really ensuring that folks who are in a public safety position are from the communities that they serve. And, and, and that we, again, just like with the com complete corruption out of the White House, that we don't become numb to this. And I know how frustrating it is, but we've made a lot of progress. And I'll just end with what happened here in Pennsylvania. We had yep. protests after George Floyd's murder in 61 of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania in places wow. that you would not expect people to be protesting in the middle of summer for police reform. But because of that, we had you know a couple of major pieces of police reform 
that were passed unanimously. I mean, Tea Party members voted for this because even in their districts, you know, people were like, this is fucking crazy. Like, <laughs> right. you have to do something. And so I just hope that people aren't getting weary and well-doing um, because yeah. it is making a difference, not making a difference fast enough, but it is making a difference. Yeah. Um, and one of the even crazier things I've heard is that a police officer can get fired and rehired by another in another district. That was one of the things we passed in, in Pennsylvania, um, creating a red flag law um, that, oh, wow. you know, you can't just move from district to district. We had a tragic shooting of a, of a young man, Antoine Rose in Pittsburgh, and that officer had numerous uh, red flags, numerous mm -hmm. issues, and he left another uh, district and then came over to, you know, Allegheny County and then you know, his mom says all the time, had we had this law, um, Antoine might have still been with us and this person may not have been on the force. And so that was one of the bills we were able to move because of the public pressure. That is amazing. And that's, it shows us, like you said, at the last sec uh, second there, public pressure. That is what yep. gets stuff done. Um, all right. Um, okay. On a lighter note, um, I guess it's not that much lighter. But um, so this election is arguably going to be the most important election in recent history. Um, and when Joe Biden calls it a battle for the soul of the nation, in many ways, that's not an understatement. You said it yourself, Donald Trump is dangerously dumb. Great use of alliteration there, by the way. Um, and so what do you feel is most at stake in November? What is on the ballot? I mean, Donald Trump is, is dangerously dumb. And not only does he not know what he's doing, he purges the White House of anybody that has any clue. I mean, a lot of the people who work in our government are not political appointees. You know, they work for every administration, just making the trains run on time, um, you know, but doing very important work. And he has really shaken our bureaucracy in a way that should be deeply troubling to anybody who cares about living in a democratic republic. A big part of what makes us different than some of these autocracies that you see is that the leader of the country doesn't just hire their family members and loyal cronies to every right. role. You have people who are subject matter experts who are in it to actually just do the work of the country, not to support any particular political party. And he has completely removed those people. And so, you know, I have conversations with folks who, you know, don't consider themselves very political or independent or are, you know, Republicans. And the reality is, even if you don't, I mean, even if you agree with some of the, you know, staple Republican things that Trump wants to do, He's not even good at that, right? Like he's not, right. he's just hes just very bad yeah. at this job. And the only part of it that he seems to care about are the parts of it that showcase him. You know, he cares about using the White House in the way he did yesterday. I mean, I'm still incredibly upset that the people's house, the people's house, that house doesn't belong. It didn't belong to President Obama. It didn't belong to President Bush, it belongs to no president. It belongs to the people. And he put the Trump logo, projected the Trump logo onto the White House. I mean, That's this insane. is absurd. And it goes at the core, the core of what our country is about. And so we can debate, you know, how to deliver universal health care. We can debate how to reform our police. We can debate tax policy, but none of those debates matter if we don't have a leader who believes in the rule of law, who believes in three branches of government, who believes that the presidency and the offices of, of government at all levels, that they don't belong to a political party, but they belong to the American people. If we have a president who doesn't believe that, then all the other debates we have are really moot. And a thunderstorm has started outside, so you might do that. <laughs> Okay. So you talk about Donald Trump long enough right. and a thunderstorm comes. Right. <laughs> How symbolic is that? <laughs> the earth is upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. It's like we don't have a hatch act anymore, right? It's, it's, he's using 
government property for direct political gain. Uh, it's something that Obama was Obama was scolded for wearing a tan suit, you know, and Trump is getting away with murder. I mean, not literally, but he's getting away with. Well, no, he is getting no, he he is as well because you look at what he's done not only with this pandemic, but our troops, our right. service members have bounties on their heads. We know this from the Russian government, and he is such a coward. He hasn't said anything about it. And so, and, and then in addition to that, you look at what happened in El Paso, you look at the vigilante um, in, in, in Wisconsin just a couple of days ago, who just shot yeah. two people in cold blood on the street. All of these people inspired by the president's rhetoric. And in El Paso, I mean, literally, you know, said, I'm inspired yeah. by the president. The president's at caravans are coming. I have to go out there. And so there is blood on his hands. And yeah. it is, it is, it is life or it is life or death. It is life or death. And I hate being hyperbolic in politics right. because people hear, you know, this is the most important election every time and it starts to lose its meaning. But I don't know if we'll have another election if we don't win this one. I really right. don't. Well said. <laughs> I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We can't take another four years of this. It, it would destroy our democracy. Um, I think we saw, I think it was sort of a wake up call to anyone who watched Obama's speech. Uh, there was no hope in that message. That was a uh, somber wake up call that we got to get this right. We can't afford to sit on our hands. We got to get out there. Yep. Um, so as a PA native and a state representative, um, I'd love to get your insight on how you think PA is voting in 2020. Is it going blue? Do you feel that Pennsylvanians have had enough? I, I do. I, th I think a part of what is important for us as we sort of understand what happened with Trump. Right. And if we get past him, it's important that we really take stock of like how we got here because so much of the divisiveness and the hatefulness that has come out of his mouth he was not the originator of, he's not an original person. Everything he does is a, a knockoff repeat of something else he's seen. So, but he has really exacerbated some of the tensions that already existed. And so I do think it's important that as we understand his presidency, um, hopefully in the past tense, that we also understand that a majority of American people did not support him. And so when I see people who, you know, want to give up on the country and say, well, how the heck did he ever get here in the first place? There's no hope. The reality is the election in 2016 wasn't won by Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. It was won by didn't vote. Yeah. Um, the majority of Americans did not vote. Right. And that apathy is what I think we're going to need to address and what I hope is being addressed and what I'm trying to address out there when I'm talking to people, that apathy, because, you know, apathy is a normal response to like being effed over over and over again, right? Like yeah. losing faith in that thing. But here's the chicken or the egg situation we find ourselves in. It is that same apathy that allows the very structures in which force people to be apathetic that allow them to continue. If young people in particular voted people you know under the age of 35 18 to 35 if if they voted if we all voted we could determine the outcome of every single election just like mathematically we right. really could and so we're in a position right now in pennsylvania and i think across the country where hopefully people recognize the emperor has no clothes um recognize that every single thing he said even if you were apathetic and you believed him Right. He asked a, a question, I believe it was here in Philadelphia, where he said it for the first time, of what do you have to lose? And now right. we know what we have to lose. Almost 200,000 Americans, the CDC projects by September, um, you know, 15 million and growing jobs lost. Um, the worst economic crisis since the Great Recession. So we see what we have to lose and our very democracy now we potentially have to lose. And so I think whether it's his trade war, which has devastated dairy farmers, whether it is 
the, the unemployment crisis, which I mentioned, Pennsylvania is ground zero for the unemployment crisis. I think a lot of the lies of this administration have come home to roost. And I yep. think if we can take 2018 um, as any example, the midterm elections, um, I think we're going to win overwhelmingly. I, ho I hope you're right there. I hope you're right. And I think you hit the nail on the head by calling um, out the, the root of the problem, which is apathy. Um, and I am encouraged, though, I do see certain things um, that make me to believe that politics is becoming the new pop culture. Um, I see every celebrity on Instagram, and I know an Instagram story is, is kind of just slacktivism, right? But they're getting the message out there. And maybe some of those people who are younger are seeing oh, what is Blackout Tuesday? What, what did that mean? Or why mm -hmm. are bail fund, um, GoFundMes are being popping up in my feed? What, so I think a lot of people are, Don, Donald Trump has become such an enigma, such a um, cancer on our society that everyone is starting to kind of wake up a little bit and see, oh, we can't, we can't go on like this. Um, and for the more shallow types, they're thinking, hey, it's cool to get involved, right? It's like, give me some clout. I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, there, there are moments when, like, I used to forget about, like, President <laughs> Obama, right? Not because he wasn't working, but because he wasn't, like, tweeting every right. <laughs> moment, and there wasn't always, like, a press conference. I mean, you know, when politics is operating at its best, yeah. you're not thinking about it. You're not thinking about <laughs> government because... Your quality of life is secure. Your job is providing a good life for you and your family. You know, things are chugging along. Um, and obviously there's always that stuff that's, that's, that's bubbling under the, the, yeah. the surface. And I think it's a sort of perfect storm of inequities and inequality that have existed for a long time. And a leader, if you, you know, if you want to call him that, who, you know, is not quietly saying any of the things, right? He is right. loudly saying all of the things. And yes. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it has broken through. Right. Make politics boring again. That's what I say. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's moved from the, the dog whistle to the bullhorn. Absolutely. Um, and so I guess finally, Trump is out of office, right? Where do we go after Trump? What's going to be required of us to continue to make progress on the national and local levels? And more importantly, uh, to me at least, what role do you see yourself playing in bringing about that progress? Um, I think you have a bright future, super bright. I'm really excited. I am a, a Malcolm Kenyatta fan. It's just, it's just the ring light, don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my hope is that people continue to be engaged. I say this all the time. I think that it is not only a recipe for being disappointed, but it's also a bad recipe in general for everybody to see political leaders as the only way change comes about in this country. So many of the leaders, whether it's my grandfather who I mentioned or Fannie Lou Hamer, who's like a personal hero of me or you know, J John Lewis, right? From before he ever ran for office. Um, so many of the folks who have changed the course of history never ran for office, ever. And so when we think about the type of coalition we need to build to provide sustainable change, it's not gonna come just because we go and vote for one person or, or we vote one time. It's gonna require us to A, vote every time, but B, be educated about the issues that are going on and C, find all the different ways that right and our communities, we can change the, the culture, we can change the outcomes on so many different levels and on so many different issues. I mean, you know, my campaign manager when I was running was like, you absolutely cannot say that. And I would say it all the time to people that the, the clouds aren't going to open up and like rainbows and like <laughs> doves come down because I got elected. You know, right. me being in office is one part of it. But if the nonprofit leaders say, well, we're done, Malcolm got elected. If yeah. the activists say, well, you know, why do we need to march anymore? The person we, we support got in office. If faith leaders and, you know, nonprofit. people who are just have big platforms stop using their voice, then we're going to be in the same sort of stasis that we were in before. I mean, I mentioned those couple of criminal justice bills that passed, but the reality is, those bills had to be introduced by great elected officials, so check. 
But many of those bills were introduced over a year before George right. Floyd's tragic murder. I mean, these bills had been sitting and the only reason they moved was not just because, you know, myself and members of the Black Caucus staged a sit-in in and, and the legislature, like that was a part of it, but it was because people who are in elected office had people in their districts on the phone, sending them letters saying, we want to see change, but they were also in their communities doing the work, educating each other, learning how to organize, learning how to be there for one another, really buying into this idea of citizenship Right. Citizenship, your democracy, if your democracy is something that's given, then it's something that can be taken away. Yeah. When we recognize that our government is about us, about each and every one of us, not about any one person who's in office or not in office, it is about us. Right. When we internalize that and believe that and hold on to our power, then honestly, who is in any office at any time is of consequence, but not as much consequence as I think we often give it. And so my hope is that people keep marching, keep yeah. coming out, that all these folks who are waking up for the first time at the inequities that exist, that they keep pushing, but not pushing just at one individual, but pushing the folks in their communities, in their neighborhoods, to get engaged, to get involved, we have to take back our power. This government derives its power from the consent of the governed. And so the governed has to recognize that this is ours. This is ours. That was a great, great, great well said. Yeah, great way to uh, end this interview here. Malcolm, thank you so much for sitting down with us. This was amazing. It's so great to meet you. I'm a big fan. And um, it's so nice to future. meet you too. And I just yeah. want to say thank you for having a, a great idea. I know it's difficult to like be in media right now with so many people like deriding <laughs> you. But thank, thank you for what you're doing because you are such an important part of how people understand what's happening, right? People can't be in every committee hearing in every room, they're living their freaking lives. But you being able to filter through what's happening is incredibly valuable. And you having a great idea and making it what it is, you should be incredibly proud. I appreciate that so much. Well, I will, well, we'll have to have a, uh, where are they now inter post interview when you're president <laughs> or senator or wherever oh, you're going gosh. next, governor. Well, I'll hold you to it, I'll hold you to it. Okay. Have a great weekend. Thank you, my Talk friend. You Take later. care. Stay safe. Bye.